Welcome back to the Lost and Found podcast. In this episode, I am rejoined by Denon Maximchuk, and we really dive into life in general, but specifically in the notion of relationships. Denon is a relationship coach and has just released a really amazing program. One of the things that I really like about Denon is his ability to articulate complexities that show up in relationships in a simple, precise, and effective way that people can digest and implement into their own lives. I, as I do, add esoteric nuances to all of the topics, but it's a real nice balance between the two of us with the precise, applicable uh, wisdom from Denon, and then I just weave all over the place with the esoteric and the philosophical and the spiritual. Um, it's really cool to hang out and to see the similarities in our uh, views and opinions whilst we might have uh, different ways in which we view life in general, but the the crossover is, is really good. And I think it'll be a great conversation for you guys to tune into. Before we get into it, a couple of things. If you're watching on YouTube, it would be great if you subscribe. I want to get over that thousand subscriber mark because then YouTube starts to push the content a little bit more. So that would be amazing. Next, if you want to find Denon, you want to find out about him as a coach, his program, you can find him on Instagram and the links are going to be below. And secondly, if you vibe with me, if you are interested in coaching with me or joining the free community call that I host twice a month, then find the links for that below. The free call is is really cool. I started off with a guided meditation and then it's just like-minded people that are seeking deeper meaning and purpose in life. We choose a different topic to discuss every time and we just hang out. We hang out, kick back, grab a glass of wine, some popcorn, whatever it is. Uh, and after the meditation, we just discuss a topic and, and really connect is the main thing. So if that calls you, it's completely for free. I just do it because uh, it feels valuable and also I enjoy it. I feel home in those spaces. And there's a lot of people that seek this type of conversation. If you're listening to this, you're likely that type. This really will resonate with you. So use the link below. You can register for that and come and hang out. All right, that's it from me. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Please comment below with bits that you enjoyed, any main takeaways that you got from it. All right, see you on the inside. Oh man, it's uh, it's it's good to be back with you again. And um, you know, before we we hit record, I was just saying like, I always I always enjoy when we have someone on the podcast a second time because like, okay, we've already made connection, we've already broke the ice, and I I genuinely enjoy catching up. What has been alive? For someone what have they been up to what's been going on in life and then how that relates to the creations that you've been uh you know birthing into the world because for me the two things are always linked you know our life story and what has been unfolding always leads us to things that we create but then i'm all, always truly interested in in the person what's actually been going on so with that being said man how's how's life been since since we we last spoke i think it was about eight or nine months ago that we spoke last and it was a great conversation but holy smokes in that time i think i've experienced the whole spectrum of life from the polarity of the most amazing side to the absolute hell on the other side in and i'm so grateful to have experienced every single part of that um, last time we spoke, I was in my, I had my, my home studio that I was shooting in. I think we just shot from my, my, um, my laptop at that point. And I was in a beautiful relationship, um, with a girl I'd been, I'd known for quite a while and we started dating. It was an incredible experience. And it was very interesting to, to go through that, having, um, gone through many of the healing phases that I'd gone through before from the past heartbreaks and things that had gone on. And. Through that conversation, we talked about many of the uh, things that we both learned in the past relationships and many things in, as with love and life. And um, and then at some point in the middle there, I came to the realization that um, my mission was taking all of my energy. And I was required to put so much into the people that I was working with and extending myself to a certain point that I came to the realization that, oh my gosh, as a relationship coach, I myself might not be ready to be in a relationship right now, which was a, a bit of a paradigm shift of, oh my goodness, what are people going to think about this? And um, at that point, my partner, who was a beautiful, conscious, tapped-in woman, was 
highly empathetic to this and understood. And she's like, I could tell that, you know, your your mission was the most important thing, as it should be for a man. Um, but to the point where it was actually a bit of a detriment. And uh, I had the opportunity in that moment to make a choice. Do I stay and, you know, not be able to give to this relationship and potentially in time resent this individual or from a place of unconditional love, move on and maybe in one day in the future meet up again. But in that time, put all of my effort into this mission, which is helping people, serving people, coming from that place of, of just love. And um, mm. so that has been the biggest change. And a month later, I moved to the other side of the world, and I'm now here in Vietnam speaking to you. So my goodness, man, it's been a it's been a trip. And that's about the uh, the spark notes version of what that past eight or nine months has looked like. Wow, yeah, that's that's really big, man. And you know, it's funny what you said. What, what will people think? Like, and and it's so easy for us to. I think when people are in the positions that we are, where we're working in this space and we're coaching others, I think sometimes we can be so, like, it's like the paradox. We end up being more critical to ourselves because there's the, I have the intellectual understanding, I have the propositional awareness. So we can be harsh on ourselves for any time in which we stray from that path of perfection. And, um, but I think there's actually something really beautiful in sharing that with others because it, I think it actually gives them more grace. Like, oh, okay, like it's okay to navigate this human experience and actually part of it is is the full spectrum. Like you said, the full polarity, actually the more to the extent in which I experience the, the radical aliveness of joy and, and pleasure and ecstasy, but also the heartbreak and, and the agony. I actually think we experience more God in that way because we have the full experience of the totality of life. I think that's true non-duality is actually feeling all of it and realizing it all, all exists. So, I mean, that's really awesome. How's it been moving across to the other side of the world? Very interesting. I think one of the uh, funniest things is... Um, <laughs> not realizing it, but meeting the <laughs> the typical passport bros when I very much never that was the intention. When I decided, okay, hey, I have this opportunity to you know work online. I I looked at my overall long term bucket list of life, and I was like, I know these things that I want to go to. Um, therefore, what do I? What would I be putting off if I was sixty or seventy? And there's things that I didn't want to do right now that I think I would regret not doing, which would be okay. I want to go check out Asia. I don't really. But I think I'd regret not doing this if I went and just found, you know, my favorite place in Spain or whatever. And then in coming here, then you start meeting these people who are the, the prototypical passport bros. And you go, oh, holy smokes. There is, if you, you know, were to go through a business course, you'd look at the dream client. And I went, oh, my goodness, I'm meeting all of these men who are not necessarily looking for a quote unquote traditional relationship, but they're more so looking for something easy. They're looking for uh, a culture that oftentimes oppresses the women in certain ways so that they can just step into this life. And I would say not have to take responsibility for many of their adolescent patterns. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's one of been one of the funniest things when uh, connecting with other men here in gyms or whatever it may be um, is obviously that part of it. Uh, because I'm sure, like you, you and I can sit in a coffee shop for a couple hours and just sit there and watch and analyze people's behaviors and how they act. And that's honestly one of my favorite things to do. It's a, the perfect Friday night, if you will. Um, but other than that, really not that much is different because people are people wherever you go. And that's the nice thing about it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I think, I think my perfect Friday night is, is probably contains psychedelics and making love. But... Maybe, maybe people watching this second. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I will um, say that there, that, is, that is one thing. It's like if you have blue eyes and uh, a good jawline here, um, one thing that doesn't happen back in Canada is people will just approach you here, which is really interesting. Uh, so you do feel like a bit of a rock star sometimes. But as you know, as conscious men, we need to be responsible with our masculinity, um, to which I could see other people um, abusing that potential power. And I'd say that's actually one of the craziest things. And we don't have to get into that and talk all about me here. We can talk about making sure we're giving, you know, actionable items back to the people. Um, 
and perhaps this is one, but I think one of the things that you do as a, as a divine masculine male is you need to be responsible with the, the emotional power that you hold uh, and understanding that many women, um, because they will emotionally attach quicker, requires you to be, um, yeah, more responsible with your, your presence, your mm. ability to perhaps, if you were a little less responsible, wrangle them in with whatever it may be. Um, which is abuse of power in many ways, abuse of your masculine ability. And I think that's one thing that's, um, after I've been in relationships for many, many years in long-term relationships, this is the first time I've had to actually see that again from the other perspective, um, which has been very funny to be like, oh, wow, I, I, here I am having to tame the animal again. And be like, ah, no, you, you can't, you, do you picture your life with this person? No. Well, then you need to be responsible and not play with them, essentially play with their heart. Um, which has been an interesting experience to go through. Yeah, that feels to me like it's um, part of the maturation process of of really a, a, awakening to more meaning. Like there's, a, there's actually more meaning to everything that we do. And I think there are a lot of men that actually don't want to look at that. It's actually more comfortable not to look at that and to acknowledge a level of power or potency and effect that they can have on the world and you know i was thinking about this a lot recently the we, we the idea that we we need to reclaim the sacred we need to reclaim the sacred nature of the sacred and that yeah. a lot of life has become profane or superficial so we then take part mm -hmm. in relation acts intimacy in a profane or superficial way where it's not revered as sacred and it's a wildly different experience than when we do that. And I, th I honestly think when we look culturally specifically, but I mean, I guess globally now, because it's hard for the Western kind of model not to infiltrate everywhere, especially with people living all over the world. But um, I think we've very much abandoned the sacred nature of anything so that the sacred nature of our masculinity, the sacred nature of femininity the sacred nature of intimacy of relation of the sexual of life itself um and and that's something to me that seems like when we can actually view ourselves and life as sacred then how can we not view someone else as sacred and realize that i actually do wield an amount of power and and i actually have to be responsible with that absolutely you know, recently I was, I was listening to a podcast, uh, Modern Wisdom podcast uh, with Chris Williamson, and he, he was talking with Ben Shapiro, and they got into the topic of relationships at one point, and uh, mm -hmm. I didn't expect that. But a really interesting point that Ben Shapiro made was that much of the, what you could say is, um, how would I say it, status game of, especially the hookup culture. Now remember, I'm a relationship coach. I'm not a dating coach. I have very little interest in that. I, I'm more so, I love love. But what he was talking about is since the feminist movements back in, back in like the 70s, um, as that has escalated to a point where I think it's now slowed down and they're realizing it probably went a little too far in some cases, as that escalated to the point where it's like, we can do everything you can do and we're going to take away many of those things from you, men started to feel less purpose and less status from being able to provide in certain ways as a man. And what, one of the only things that you couldn't take away is as a man, perhaps our fight against this, not on purpose, but just subconsciously is, well, if, if there's not many things I can value myself for, maybe I can value myself as in the highly attractive, you know, sex machine who's just going moving from partner to partner to partner. And then you started to see this, especially when I was growing up in my teens, where men started comparing notches, you know, oh, how many girls have you slept with? Oh, you've been with 10? Oh, you pussy, you've only been with four. But then you start to realize, oh, there's, there's a gamification of this, but it's one of the only things that these movements couldn't take from men. And it's kind of almost sad to say, like, that's all that was left over in many ways. Now, we see the tide turning back the other way, but you can kind of start to understand, and I'm kind of riffing on what he talked about, but you can kind of understand how it got to that point with the fact that, well, you're not special in any way. So what is the only things that would be unique to you as a speciality would be your ability to have multiple partners, which is very interesting. And then you see the Andrew Tates and stuff that would very much take that as a status symbol of a high quality or high value male, when in reality, we just made that up. 
Yeah, man, this, it's it's a really good point, and the idea of the gamification it almost. I, I think I think we're of similar age, and yeah, same thing. You know, we'd, you'd grow up and you'd even like you know American Pie, popular film for me as a teenager. Yes, and there'd, there'd be that. <laughs> I never know. look at pie different. I never look at pie the same. <laughs> <laughs> I eat so much more of it now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, that, that idea of it's this um, almost competitive thing. I am, I am more of a man, a more successful man if I've had more partners. And I can say that I fully, I fully uh, played that, that game in, in my youth because it really was part of the culture and, you know, part of this, there's almost an indoctrination of, of that that was something to be valued and that in some way would make you a more quality man and you know back, man back in 2000 and five i think 2005 you know i really entered deep into like the pickup scene mm. um i was i was i was really deep in that and, and took it seriously took it seriously and you know now I, I, I look back and reflect on that and think gosh it was really narcissistic and almost like 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 a level of psychopathy in a way where there was almost no regard no regard as this person that I was entering into any level of intimacy with was actually human it kind of disregards the human experience for the other and you can see how it really actually um creates like a a, a narcissistic completely egocentric um pattern of behavior whilst it might not make the individual a quote-unquote narcissist but there's actually patterns of behavior where we become very detached and it becomes this completely egocentric way of existing um versus now the way in which i relate to intimacy and the sexual which i think couldn't be more to the other end of the spectrum and before we hit record i was talking about you know like the the kabbalistic teachings that i've been in in the exploration mm -hmm. and learning of and you know hebrew tantra and you know literally for me uh, last week whilst making love to my beloved I, I felt my egoic self crumble away where I knew myself to be the desire of all reality and the desire of all reality was to lose myself in my beloved so I could find myself. And that was mm. my experience whilst in making love. And it's like, it, it's very much a tantric practice, but it was, and, and one of the, I'll, I'll just share this and I'll shut up, but one of the ideas that within- No, please. Uh, the, the, the Kabbalistic teachings is that there is a death in every orgasm. We die to the orgasm and we die to our beloved. And there's that moment of seeing the, the light of awakening where the egoic self can actually die during the orgasm. So I die to the orgasm, but also I die to my beloved. And the part of me that dies is the egoic self that separates myself from her. And there's like the death of that, where I then enter further in and then I find a renewed version of myself in there. And it's just this really potent, beautiful practice. Um, so yeah, that's, that was just coming up. <laughs> no, I loved it. I, I don't remember what teachings it was from. Um, sometimes I'm horrible at quoting back where I learned things from, but there was a, one of the fellows it was either a fellow or a book that I was reading. It was talking about how, uh, like the male orgasm is the most out of body experience, well, out of mind experience, but 100% in the feeling essentially into your feminine state, because it is nothing but experience. You are completely out of your head and completely in the experience of life. Um, therefore, there is that moment of like, what true eternity and uh, existential experience outside of life itself would be like for a very brief few seconds. Um, and I think that's such a wonderful thing. I'd be interested to hear from you, though, since I think a lot of this is a good conversation of just learning out loud and experiences that we've had and then apply back into not only our clients and um, to each other, but 
I think for myself, and this what might relate with people who are listening as well, is um, when we go back to the discussion on like, okay, coming out of the hookup scene, right? Um, you and I are just fine guys. We're, we're doing okay in that scene. We're, we're, we've got our physical attractive qualities. So it's like, there is a degree of you and I had to learn our responsibilities, probably you a little bit more than I, not going to lie. That tan is not something I can ever step up to, but I wish I could. Um, however, there's that moment where we actually start to step out of that ego self and realize that we have to do that. A, I want to know what yours kind of was. Um, but mine, and kind of one of the things I usually bring up early in, in the journey when somebody is working with me is the discussion of the who am I, right? Um, and I think what we can do is take the egocentric self that we had before and still remain egocentric with it. Um, and in the way of, you know, when we go through the, uh, uh, what was the book? The Untethered Soul. I forget the, the name of the author, but, you know, it's one of usually people's like early books into their, their journeys. Uh, and I think it's a great introductory book. Um, but when we go through the question of who am I, and, you know, you're not your name, you're not your job, you're not da, 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 we get to back to, okay, you are, you know, conscious being within this human vehicle, this flesh mm -hmm. vehicle, essentially, that we are moving around in, we can take that egoic, okay, I'm doing all of this for me, and we can reverse it, but still come from a place of me, of, am I doing everything here to essentially another version of myself? Because, if all I am is consciousness, which could be argued is a universal experience, that your consciousness could be the same universal consciousness as mine, just in a different body and a different experience, uh, different programming, different behaviors that you've learned over time from this element of the person, the acute human animal, can we then ask ourselves, okay, if that's me in another human body and another human experience, would I want to do this to myself? And then we can go, kind of go back to the Bible of like, you know, don't do what you would do to your neighbor or, or do what you would want to do to your neighbor. And some of the earliest teachings in that, I don't know the exact quote, but that's essentially what it is. Then we can take that kind of ego look of like, oh, this is for me. And then reverse it in the same way of like, oh, what if that is me? And I think that's a way that people can relate to it really well. So instead of trying to make it entirely external, we can actually relate and have empathy for the first time in our lives in many cases. Uh, and I think that was a big opening for me was probably the first time I ever felt empathy truly for other people was when I started to look at things from that perspective of, oh, that's me. And after like eight to eight years of coaching individuals in the fitness and health industry, that was ironically the first time I actually realized what coaching was. And I think that could be a good door for a lot of people. So check out the book, uh, The Untethered Soul, if, if you're early in this journey. However, I have to assume most of your listeners are probably not early in this journey, but it might be another way to look at it if you need another perspective. Yeah, 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 that was that was great. Now, what, what was the question at the beginning? I, I was deep into listening then. The question at the beginning, was there a question? What was, yeah, what was your moment or sequence of events that led you to realizing, oh, hold on, this is not something that is, uh, well, not coming from a place of love, that's for sure. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So your place of empathy for other people, I would say. I would say it was a, it felt like an unfolding, it felt like an unfolding rather than a Kairos moment. Mm. And about, uh, Approaching a decade ago is is the first time I did ayahuasca. That I went into that as an atheist and came out understanding God. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, it's mind blowing to, to even say that and to consider that I realized the God I didn't believe in didn't exist, but I understood what God was and I felt how I truly was connected to everything to the all that is that i literally am an expression of the divine and that i participate in life i am life participating in life as life that i would say was the beginning of really starting to create a a shift but but at the point where there, there was a moment where it really kind of hit for me a few years ago where I think I had a different perspective of the sexual 
in that it was actually a way to experience more God. And in that moment, I realized that actually the sexual and, and, and my teacher, uh, Dr. Gaffney says this, the, the erotic and the holy are one. And it was realizing that there's this deeply sacred, holy nature to the sexual. And it was at that moment I realized, oh, I get what, I understand why promiscuity is a sin. And etymologically, sin means to miss the mark. Mm. It means to miss the target. The, both the Greek and the Hebrew is to miss the mark. And it's like, oh yeah, the promiscuous lifestyle is completely missing the mark because it's it's not allowing you to have this deeply spiritual experience through the sexual in this just kind of like mindless act of sexing. Um, and There's it, a that beautiful point, quote. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that was, I was going to say that, that was the moment I would say where that probably really then hit. But there was like an unfolding of the journey to have to learn more and more of this uh, place of myself in, in reality. And, you know, you, you said about kind of figuring out who we are. And one of the things that I will talk about, um, I have like a list of different topics I can talk about in uh, events on, on a stage or on podcasts. One of them is who versus what. And there's the who development. Who am I? Which we could say is kind of this horizontal dimension of development. But then there's what I am, which is the vertical dimension to awaken from just who I am to what is my essential nature. And I would say now I spend more time in the exploration of what I am rather than who I am. And in that what, I can then recognize, without knowing the who you are, I can recognize what you are. And I think then we can start to see other people. If I understand that I am an expression of, of the one consciousness, like you said, the one life that began 13.8 billion years ago, that evolved where subatomic particles became atoms, that became single-celled organisms, mm. you know, cells, single-celled mm. organisms, multicellular organisms, to, to eventually humans, to these complex societies. And eventually it became me and it became you. If I understand that I am a part of that unfolding of evolution, I know that you are as well. So without knowing you, I can appreciate, without knowing who you are, I can appreciate what you are. And then I can, I can approach you with this reverence and, and wonder to get to know the who, which is the expression of the what. So I've landed there and now, Am I always perfect Perfect at that? Do I still judge people at times? Yeah, sure. But then I, I try my best to catch it. Ah, I'm, I'm assuming or I'm judging. Let me remember the what and now be curious about the who rather than concluding it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, you just took that and you were like, I hear your who are you discussion and I raise you 10. <laughs> that is beautiful, man. I love that. That's, that's exactly what I think a lot of people need to see. It's like actually the um, miracle, truly, which is the fact that we are even here and for this experience. And I think that's a great way to look at it is to look at the you know 13 billion year process to even sitting here and having this conversation from one side of the world to the other. It's like, oh, nothing but appreciation there. There was one really interesting thing you were talking about, which was um, eroticism. And, uh, you know, how to a degree that's, that's going to be a sin in, in when not directed correctly, right? I heard a really good quote recently, which is that eroticism is the energy, or sorry, that's not right, because I took a note down here, it was perfect, I've literally got it by the computer. Um, eroticism is the enemy of intimacy, and intimacy is the enemy of eroticism, which I think is really, really interesting. So eroticism is the enemy of intimacy, and intimacy is the enemy of eroticism, which essentially like would mean in a relationship, like. If we have pure eroticism, this is essentially newness. This is drama. This is excitement. This is the experience of meeting a girl in a bar on a Thursday night, hopefully not a Thursday night, <laughs> but meeting somebody in a bar. There's so much excitement. You don't know anything about this person. You don't know how they're going to 
you know, you get in bed, oh my God, everything's new. Like, I don't know how they do things, but it's just pure excitement. But intimacy is completely different. Intimacy is depth. Intimacy is knowing. Intimacy is that deep, deep experience. And I think a lot of times people get really, especially in the relationship setting, once they start to lose that eroticism in the relationship, yes, they have that intimacy, but there's still that desire, even from an evolutionary psychology perspective of like, we are animals at the end of the day. We, you know, we are embodied within this animal, which means we want to continue procreating and pushing the, uh, the species along. That's why the, you know, we are going to have the honeymoon phase. We are going to want to make a baby, want to make a baby. Let's just have red hot sex from six months to two years. And then the brain changes and that starts to go away because we couldn't not, we, we couldn't have that child because if the body thinks I'm having sex, I'm having sex, obviously there's going to be a child coming. So we can't keep going on this highly erotic journey. Otherwise, there's going to be a child in the other room or from our ape-like bodies, you know, at the end of the cave. We can't just keep having ferocious sex and not take care of this child. And when we start to realize, especially in this interesting modern age, that we're still dealing with this millions-year-old programming that we've got, we still have to deal with this weird back and forth of this eroticism versus, or ideally, and the intimacy in, in a relationship, which is really tricky for people. And I'm sure you've seen this with, with your relationship clients. It's like, we have this depth, but we still, we lack this excitement and trying to balance the two in a relationship, which takes a ton of effort. And I just think it's kind of interesting when you brought it up is because would, would eroticism still be a sin? Because I'm not as familiar with this, you know, the, that side of it as you are in a relationship setting uh, as, as compared to, you know, obviously just in, in a more public setting, if there's not an intention behind it. Oh yeah. So this is really cool. So one of the things that, um, that Gaffney talks about, so I've, I've actually, so, so this is a review draft, although now the actual, uh, official draft is out first principles and first values of evolving perennialism. And it's 42 propositions of cosmoerotic humanism. Oh, and this let's is... go, baby. Let's go. <laughs> so this is written by uh, Dr. Mark Gaffney, Dr. Zach Stein, and Ken Wilbur. And one of the things that they talk about here, and, and that one of the teachings of, of, of Mark, is that... Eros is the, the field and the, the force that moves through all reality, that moves through you, and we have exiled it only in the sexual. Eros is actually ecstatic aliveness. And to live an erotic life is to live a holy life, meaning that in, in our... So when he says we've exiled eroticism into the sexual he says that the only time we experience that full radical fuck aliveness is when we're in the sexual however that full aliveness is the nature that moves all reality and all existence and moves through like all of evolution and mm. we've exi we've exiled it so most of the time now we think erotic to be erotic is to be sexual and he will say yes the sexual is erotic however we can live an erotic life which, do, which doesn't mean to live a sexual life all the time but that same pulsing throbbing impulse of yearning and desire can fulfill us all the time where we have that level level of of, of energy to move through everything that we do and it's to realize that eros and the and and to be erotic is actually a feature of all of cosmos that is the current that drives all evolution and all reality of which moves through us so he will say that we you know desire has been told like you know we've got to figure out these desires you know you're this bad person because you feel these desires but actually desire is the currency of reality that creates newness and evolution it's the desire for something else there are there are subatomic particles that desire to come together 
and it's to create something new that is more complex, that is more advanced, that contributes to more life, more unfolding of life, to create an atom. And then atoms desire to come together. And that desire to come together is the desire for intimacy. And in the intimacy, we create something new that couldn't have existed without the two of us coming together. So what they propose is that it's actually all the way up and down the evolutionary chain from quarks all the way to, to what we are. That desire that is in us to come together to create something new that couldn't exist without us, that actually contributes to the evolutionary process, is the desire that began 13.8 billion years ago that moves through us. And if we try to suppress that desire, we're actually suppressing the fundamental energy of all life that allowed us to be in existence. So, I mean, it's, it's such a, a deep and wild philosophy that kind of switches a lot of things on the head. But for me, when I start to really understand this, it's like I felt it in my body, like, oh, it, it makes it makes sense. And the idea that, and, and I'll, I'll finish with this, within Kabbalah, there is a saying, which is more God to come. There is more God to come. God is continually unfolding and when we come together with our beloved in intimacy the desire that we feel to penetrate deeply and and to make love it's it's yes in the human level is to have a child but what do we actually do we actually create more god we actually create more god because mm -hmm. God is unfolding through us. We are an expression of God. And then when we, for example, make a child, there is more God in existence. But not only that, in the conversation you and I are having now, there's a level of, of uniqueness in both of us. But then we come together with shared recognition, the shared value. And we have this conversation. And through this conversation, something is created that literally couldn't have been created if we didn't come together to have it right now. And in doing so, someone hears this and it unlocks something in them. And we actually contribute to the unfolding of more God. So more God to come. Oh, man. I feel like I just want to interview you. Your flow states that you go in are so beautiful. Oh my, you're so well, better spoken than I am. <laughs> well, I got two things to say on that. Um, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I actually think uh, one of the things I appreciate about you and all your content, there's a, you're really wax lyrical. I think you share uh, concepts in a really, really clear and easy to understand way. You things that actually are complex I think you explain them in a, in a really, in a way that I think allows for people to really understand something complex in a very digestible way. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Um, two things on, on that beautiful monologue you just went on, um, which I think I want to listen back to because I'm learning things as well, is um, <laughs> number one, it, relating it back to a relationship frame, a uh, sexual relationship frame, since that's what I see most things too. Um, when you're talking about like the constant creation of more and weirdly nature and the universe aligns with that constant desire to do that, the first thing is related to science. Interestingly, when a man, I'll have to find a study and see if I can send it to you. Interesting, when a man um, is intimate with somebody who is not their partner, and by the way, I have no idea how they did this study, um, but when they are with somebody who is a stranger, their sperm count increases three times, which is literally just nature aligning to be like, oh, yeah, we're going to create more right now, which is very, very interesting how that can happen so quickly. Um, and the second thing I would say is to not more so speaking to men in this case, because, you know, there's going to be a bit more of that animalistic urge from testosterone, but to not shame yourself for the attraction to the feminine which is not just going to be in the form of a woman. Obviously, the feminine can be experience in general, just your the being, right? Because so much of the time we spend in this doing mode. But your your desire to, to be in the being, which is going to be, yes, it can be sex. Yes, it can be in the form of physical feminine. 
um, but also to nature, to music, to any sort of flow activity. But especially when you do feel that, there recently was one of my individuals I was working with, um, a very, very high income earner, um, and is constantly in the turns and things that are happening in business. So even though he has this spectacularly beautiful partner, um, he himself walks into a room and has an incredible amount of presence. And other women are attracted to him. And he notices it. And he's very interested. He's kind of confused. He's like, he, he himself is a very attractive male, just physically looking anyway. Sometimes he's confused by that. But he starts to notice himself initiating, even just with the looks, right? And he has so much shame about even noticing that other people would be attracted to him. And part of it was trying to teach him that we can take all that beautiful energy that, like you were talking about, like, that is going to keep coming to you. And it is going to keep telling you to flourish and move into that in some way. But you can take that and redirect it back into the relationship. You just need to learn ways to do that. There's very specific greeting strategies that you can, you can use for that, that, like, quite literally visualizing breathing down into your pelvis, into your, you know, your sexual organs calling the girl like your own girlfriend or even just sending a flirtatious text to her be like i cannot wait to come home to you tonight and just ravage you or whatever it may be but finding ways to take that sexual energy when you start to experience it, it may not be sexual but you may feel it in that way and learning how to re redirect that in a healthy expressive way is i think something that many people but specifically men in this case struggle with because they feel shame number one for for having that desire and then number two, they start to question their own self and relationship. And it's normal. <laughs> it's completely normal. Yeah, they're really great points. You know, something I was I was saying uh, to Colette, my partner, the other day, is it seems as though um, there's something like um, women want to be noticed as beautiful and men want to be noticed by beauty. Mm -hmm. it, it seems that there's some type of dynamic. I've not, I've not uh, fleshed that out in, entirely, but it's some, something like that. And, um, you know, what, what you were saying then, like, if I, you know, the, 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 the gentleman you, you pertain to, he, he will notice if he's being noticed. And, and I think if you're a man that actually has a liveness or a woman that has a liveness, you're going to be noticed because there's a lot of people that there's actually kind of the kind of deadens in, in a way. And if you have a presence, people in general will notice that. And there's actually something I think that is inherently beautiful. If we were to look at the good, the good, the true and, and the beautiful, I think aliveness, that's why nature is beautiful. It's alive. And I think there's something in a person that in their aliveness will be noticed. And, and I think sometimes if I, you know, I, I or, you know, the, the gentleman you spoke to, if he notices that he's being noticed, it's like, ah, is that, is there a wrongness to that? And, and like you said, I think sometimes it's that little bit of kind of tweaking because one way that could be perceived is, ah, I am noticed by others and I am noticeable and I am desirable, and fuck yeah, awesome. And and all of this is for my beloved. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think that can do more for a relationship when when I, I know that I'm noticed, but in, in absolute full choice, I am in complete devotion to my partner. It actually, there's something about that which I think makes it even more valuable reframing is the secret to life. Um, when you can get really good at just the cognitive behavioral therapy practices of constantly reframing things for your own like benefit, oh, I mean, you can change your life just with that practice alone. Um, but I agree with you because I, I think one of the biggest things that men cling to is just capability. You know, we just want to feel capable. We want to know that we have the freedom to be capable and then have the power to be able to bring that to the people around us. And if that means that, okay, I see that desirability, or I see that people desire my skills or whatever it may be, we do feel more capable. Because I mean, we as men, we, can, we don't get our flowers till the day we die, right? So when we get those small little reminders throughout the day, 
those can be the battery that powers us for weeks sometimes. And I do think those small wins, which are not recognizable by others, but recognizable to us, is something that we should, whether that be journal on or hold for a moment of gratitude, um, because it does oftentimes give us that fuel to bring it back in, so long as we practice that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the, the reframing piece is is so big. And, um, you know, on, on that, I'd, I would love to hear more about the the program that you've recently uh, launched, uh, you know, you've created and, and released this relationship program. And, and like I said, I, I always see you in your social post take, you know, deep kind of complexities of relationships and, and dynamics and explain them in a, in a very well laid out way. And, you know, for anyone who, is interested that they, they should absolutely check it out and i'll make sure to put all the uh links uh in in the podcast but I'd, yeah i'd love to find out more and know more about the the program that you've just put out i appreciate that i um yeah so i spent the past year um building out a course that i tested uh with the public which is no longer publicly available and it's only available now within like um basically i'm doing a 16 week intensive program for couples. It doesn't have to be with couples. It can be with uh, single individuals as well, or individuals who are just coming into it on their own, uh, but perhaps maybe their partner's not involved with it. Um, but the basically, it's, uh, it's, it's a coaching program, but then there's also a course involved with it. And that course is 20 hours of just full-blown material that you can use in adjunct to the one-to-one -one coaching, which would be involved in the program. Um, but inside of that, yeah, it's just <laughs> a collection of as many things as I could possibly organize so that an individual, uh, once they work one-on-one, -on -one, they can still go to this full-blown resource, which I was considering putting into a book. Um, but I just realized, I know at least for myself, I learn, and as you know, you know, you don't make things for other people. You should usually make things for the past version of yourself. I learned very well from, from video. So I put the entire thing into a massive 20 hour program. Um, which usually should be just followed along as it is. And in that time I was making it, I actually realized uh, <laughs> I can't stand the term life coaching. I just think there's so much attached to that. But then I've, over time, I've come to realize, as I'm, I'm sure you have, and that's why I've always called it, tried to call it guidance or mentorship and or all these other things to avoid possibly following into that 2015, 22 year olds on Instagram who rented a Lamborghini kind of type category. You know exactly the type I mean. And um, over the course of making the program and working with more and more individuals, I, I, I've had this funny experience of realizing that pretty much everybody's dealing with two or three core issues in whether that be their psyche or some sort of area in life. But the easiest way to find those things that are usually causing challenges in their, um, in their relationship is when we look into the relationship. It, it's, the, it's the most easy mirror for an individual to see their, their own shortcomings, their flaws, their blind spots and areas that they actually haven't started to bring out in themselves or even come aware of in the first place. So what started as a full-blown relationship coaching program very quickly turned into a, oh, that's actually the back half and the entire first half is essentially relearning yourself. And I was very worried to speak about that in the beginning because I was like, oh, no, people aren't going to be excited about that because they constantly come to me going, my partner this, my partner this, my partner this, not realizing that, you know, in a relationship, it takes 200%, 100% and 100% of two people coming in all the time. Um but the more and more I started to dive into this and go deeper into it, I was like, what probably should have been a five hour course, very quickly I started going, ah, oh, when I'm not taking the due diligence to do the pre work that would be required of somebody to truly transform a relationship. So most of the journey that people come to me on, and I'm sure same with yourself, they come to me in search of the better relationship. But what usually happens is it ends up being two people on an individual journey that then coincides into a beautiful journey together. But usually the relationship part is only like 20 to 25%. The other 75% is each individual on their own path growing themselves, and then that allows them to come consciously together as one. 
So ideally the program, which is just the relationship transformation program, which can be 16 weeks. And then we move into usually just maintenance coaching after that for just when you need it and to keep things moving. Um, is ideally best for two people coming together who want to go become better themselves, see their blind spots. And typically in marketing, I would talk about the pain points and whatnot, but I'd have to assume most people would know what their pain points are. At least if they're listening to you, they say they're largely conscious individuals and self-aware. And then after that, um, we usually start coming together a little bit more in conjunction with the program that they can also have for the rest of their life. So that's what I've made. That's what I spent the last year and a half making. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. So thank you for asking. Yeah, that's awesome, brother. Congratulations on that. I know when you spend, cause, and, and it's not just an, a year and a half that you've been making it. You've actually, in ways, been making it for years through everything you've been going through, everything you've been learning, everything you've been figuring out through lived experience, you know, experiential participation, uh, propositional understanding, perspectival, all these different ways that you've been navigating life. And then like it's kind of like the last year and a half of actually them putting it into something made manifest is that almost like the cherry on the cake, but everything before. So I think it's, it really is like birthing a baby in many ways. I, I have lost sleep. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's great. And, and like you said, it's, it, it really comes down. It really highlights the individual's journey. And, um, you know, something I've reflected on before is anyone who is more conscious, I think, can actually find that they can, at least to begin with, experience maybe a more turbulent relationship than someone who might be unconscious. Because there usually is a higher degree of sensitivity. There's more sensitivity. There's more awareness. And I think often as well... With a greater level of development in one's self, they can work on a lot of the blind spots as an individual. But then in relationship, there's a whole different set of blind spots that now are getting activated, other triggers that are being activated. So someone could have been really doing the work on their own. And actually, as a person on their own, um, and I I'm saying this as from personal experience, could feel like very little would affect me. You know, I remember a, a couple of years ago um, seeing that my crypto wallet was hacked and had a, a you know, in a moment, was oh. a quarter of a million dollars. Oh and, my gosh. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's news to yeah. me. I can't believe you've never told me that. Holy yeah. smokes, yeah. dude. But, you know, but, but dealing with it in a way where I was just like, Okay. Okay. <laughs> like, I surrender. And being able to handle a lot of things in my own personal life where I could really be present with so much, but then entering into a deeply loving relationship, and there's just a whole different set of things that I actually didn't have the opportunity to work on in the same way. I literally can't work on certain things on my own that I can do in a relationship. So then we can experience these really high levels of consciousness in a relationship. And then all of a sudden, something very old that I actually couldn't work on before because I wasn't in the container that would shine the light on it gets triggered. And now it's like I dropped through the floor and go through these really like deep, painful experiences in relationship. And then you figure it out. And then all of a sudden, both people, especially if both people are conscious, are now in this very conscious state. And it can almost feel bipolar in a way because you can oh, yeah. then enter into these really high levels of consciousness together. And then something very old gets triggered, which can pull you down to the opposite end of the, the polarity. So, and the reason I say that is because that has been my experience of, of myself and others that are on this journey of raising their consciousness and sometimes it can be like oh my god what is wrong with me so i'm just saying that as a moment of uh maybe to to relax that if you do experience this i believe that is kind of what's going on is that when we are highly conscious we then have this whole set of things that 
we actually need to be in the relationship, I believe, in a way, to see those aspects of ourselves. So I think what you were saying there is, is amazing and really needed. And for people to understand, if there are these aspects of self that have not yet been clarified, that now you are in a relationship are being highlighted, it doesn't necessarily mean you're in the wrong relationship. It might just reflect that, oh, I've not yet had the opportunity to work on these parts of myself. It's a skill issue. Mm. Yeah, I, okay, so I, I really like, I'm really happy you, you elaborated on that because this is, with my single individuals that I work with the mentorship and guidance, I hear this very frequently. So a lot of times they'll come to me after a bad breakup, because this is usually when men start to come to their enlightenment phase, is like, oh my gosh, I just lost everything. Now I actually have to rebuild. And now I'd be ready to hear out, you know, other possibilities, perspectives, and start to break the habit of being myself, essentially, as Dr. Joe Dispenza would say. And mm -hmm. a lot of the times, maybe a few months, three, six, nine months into the journey, this is when you start to hear them say, I don't want to get into another relationship until I've healed, which is one of the largest falsehoods that could possibly exist. But because we see all of this um, perpetuation of this on uh, social media, of healing, 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 you don't want to hurt other people, heal, heal, heal. They're not realizing that arguably the most spiritual experience and journey of a man's life, especially, is a relationship. This is where everything gets put to the test. And therefore, I would highly recommend to the individual that you might be terrified. I know you might not be totally healed, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go into these experiences, which in many cases actually can be extremely healing. Once you realize that, oh, I can be with somebody that calms my nervous system instead of keeping me on high alert all the times and actually allows me to go deeper into the not only self-exploration, but... Um, realization of many of these skills that I can't practice on my own, exactly like you said. So I think that's just one of the little falsehoods that we kind of need to get out of the the talk of, uh, which I really think people just used to sell shit, which pisses me off, honestly. Like, you're not ready to go to here, so come to me and I can heal you, and then you'll be ready to go out. It, it, essentially creating a false gate that doesn't exist. But some people out there who, I won't name names, but actually people you and I both know, and I know that, um, are kind of putting out there. And that drives me nuts. And one day I'll unleash. <laughs> but I'm going to hold back for now. I get very passionate. <laughs> yeah, no, I I really agree with that, man. Like it's, it's yeah, heal yourself. But if, if you think that means you're going to go into a relationship and there aren't going to be things that arise, it's it's naive. It's, it, it's absolutely things are going to get highlighted and perhaps actually perhaps that's a great cue for guys if, if you're a single male and you've gone through a bit of a healing phase and you get to that point and to expect that you might have that thought of oh i, I don't think anything could hurt me great you're definitely ready to go deeper that's kind of your cue maybe you now you're absolutely ready to date no there's always going to be things that come up whether you like it or not but that thought might come up and i thought that at one point too it's like oh, I'm healed. And then sure enough, you get into it and you go, oh, I'm broken. <laughs> and I think that might be a good cue to expect those thoughts to come. Yeah, truly. And, you know, two, two things that from what you were saying before, two things popped up. And one is, I think one of the things that can be actually very difficult is a, maybe as a man, but maybe as a person, actually, maybe it's just a human thing. When you went into a relationship, you might start to see how much of there are parts of yourselves that you don't love that someone else does. And sometimes you don't know what to do with that because it can be hard to believe that this part of me that I have rejected and detested my entire life, when someone else sees that part and loves it, like the ego doesn't know what to do with that. So even mm. that is like, ah, <laughs> what, about, what do I do? And then maybe you have to look at that part and go, oh, maybe that's lovable. And it can even act as a reflection of where I don't love myself and where I need to love that part of me. So th that arose. Uh, again, that's not going to happen on your own. That's not going to happen. And, and then the other part 
is I think one of the things that we, when we really enter into a relationship where we are in that like love adore union, we actually start to see where there are parts of my egoic self that actually kind of need to die. Where it is this kind of, there might be this, these more like adolescence aspects of me that is more in egocentrism, but not in a clarified way in this kind of, maybe there's some selfish aspects of me that actually part of my maturation is I need to let that die to this relationship which allows me to be more of service to be in contribution and you know it's the, it's the reason I, I wear this it's the reminder when Christ said deny yourself pick up your cross and come with me deny yourself is like, what are the aspects of myself part aspects of my story which might be my fears or my kind of selfish lower self desires not my clarified desires but these kind of like lower self desires what parts of those do i need to deny what is it that i might need to sacrifice that i hold on to which actually prevents me from being the best version of myself that i could be and i think there is nothing quite like a relationship that can allow for that. Like what aspects of myself am I holding on to that actually I need to let go of to become a greater version of who I am and, and loving someone else and I, th I think can really usher that journey. Oh, I am going to transcribe that word for word and I know exactly which one of my clients I'm sending that to. That was perfectly said. Um, I think one thing I can add to that is the, uh, when you were talking about how the parts of yourself you reject that other people can love, I don't mean to be directing this conversation at men. I actually work with more women than I do men, but uh, I feel like this is, I guess, two guys talking. It's like we're in the locker room, and that kind of brings me to, I was a hockey player growing up, to give you a personal example. Um, before that, I was in martial arts. Now, in martial arts, uh, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, like, the ego actually there in, in the the areas that I was in but in, especially in hockey there's a huge amount of like hyper masculinity especially when you're at the rink that's the place to just unleash it however I myself I'm actually a very feeling balanced core and perhaps even leaning a little bit more into the feminine side um, therefore for me I would always shun that side of myself that was very emotional very loving and even you, you can hear it when I speak sometimes I start getting a little aggressive <laughs> but that really, that's just that, that feeling side of me. I really feel those emotions. And people would always say like, oh, Denon is just a guy that wears a heart, wears his heart on his sleeve. So maybe I'd get angry, break my stick over the post, or we'd lose a huge game. I'd be just crying, just angry. And I really feel all those things. And for years, I would be like, God, I'm such a pussy. And, and then I realized that the, the one of the reasons that... Um, especially in my relationships that women felt so safe with me is that I could give them that space to feel safe, to speak to any of these things that allowed them to actually express themselves in a safe manner. But even in those relationships, I would self-sabotage so many of those moments because again, I was like, Oh, you're doing that thing again, you pussy. Mm. And I break down the safety that I was naturally so able to give this individual. And I think so many men, oftentimes in those moments, when it comes time to stepping into the shoes of your partner, feeling and understanding the underlying emotions that they're trying to bring to you, and then you start to feel something. Oh, God. Oh, I don't want to feel those things. No, step up. Be a man. And then we realize that later, after multiple heartbreaks, that actually we were sabotaging our very own relationships by not allowing us to step into that feminine side of ourselves that oftentimes we are denying constantly because of social media or any of these places where so much bullshit gets spewed in 60 seconds, but it's a good sound bite, so it gets views. Um, I think it's one of the largest things I want to rebel against in the, the, the social movements or, or just the, the dialogue going on is ensuring that people understand that you really, especially men, you have to take in both sides of that. And that feeling and emotional side of yourself, although it needs to be expressed skillfully, um, you do need to be able to tap into that part of yourself. And it's even the most conscious and trained men, I find with the social dialogue going on, are constantly fighting against that within themselves, even myself. 
I'm not saying I'm like some highly conscious man. <laughs> I'm not at your level of understanding of many of these things. I'm very much still on my journey. And many of your guests actually are people that I work with uh, for my own journey. So um, don't want to sit there and act like I'm holier than thou. I'm most certainly not. Oh man, I don't know if any of us are, but um, no, everything you're saying, I, I, absolutely, man. Um, it's to be able to embrace uh, both and, and to realize that we're, we're, we're actually, you know, the whole idea of like masculine and feminine balance, every single one of us is a unique expression of a very specific configuration of masculine and feminine energy. There's actually no one person that has the exact same configuration of the two energies within them. And that's going to be expressed in, in all the different ways. And when we start to embrace our unique nature, which is, yes, I am the I am the I above the self of the one consciousness, the one life of all reality, yes. And I can close my eyes and I can locate that and I can access that. And then the moment I open my eyes, I realize that expression has a unique perspective through my eyes. And I have a unique experience and I have a unique story and I have a unique gift. And as do you, we all do. And when I can really just start to locate what is my clarified expression, what is the way in which that shows up and start to realize that's beautiful. And if I cry, it is beautiful. And actually my, my tears are tears of aliveness, whether that is heartbreak or whether it is tears of ecstasy, but it's, it's aliveness and we're actually alive doing the thing. And I think when we reject that, if it's if it's if it moves through us freely, we're actually kind of just rejecting that experience of being this unique configuration of life in its aliveness. That's perfect. I, I lost you for a quick second there. My I think my data just ran out, but it came back perfectly as you were ending that monologue. So I did miss a little bit in the middle there, <laughs> but I'm back. <laughs> oh, no worries, man. No worries. Um, ah, brother, thank you for for being here again, I, I really enjoy our conversations. And, and like I said, there's, and, and to your point, there are lots of, I, I want to say this again, there are lots of things out there on relationships. There are people in the consciousness space that talk about conscious relationships. And whilst very well intended, I think, I think they miss, I think they miss some of the practical pragmatic understandings and every relationship issue that shows up is because you're deeply wounded and broken whereas you said a word earlier that i think is very powerful it's skills so much of this is like oh i've not yet developed the skill set it's not because i am deeply wounded and i have all this healing to do it's like oh no there's just a missing skill ah when i when i realize this skill i can I can actually operate in a much yeah. healthier way. It, it's not my existence is a problem. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, I mean, I think of one way that people can think about this is like driving a car. Like when it comes to developing a skill set, there, there's three stages. There's thinking, there's doing, and then there's being. When we start to drive a car, do you, do you remember the first time you had to take a left turn onto the highway? It's terrifying. You have to press the gas pedal just right so that you don't rear end the person in front of you, but also hard enough that you don't go nowhere and get rear ended. And then while you're doing that, you actually have to turn the wheel to ensure that you stay in the lane and don't drift off and hit the car next to you or hit the, the kind of the curb in the middle, therefore bouncing the car up. And then your dad's yelling at you in the passenger seat, like, get out, pull over. There's so many things going on. It's terrifying, right? But then over the course of weeks and months, you get to the point of doing, where now you can take that turn. And although you have to pay attention, you know, you, you can't just go fully unconscious. You, that's easy. Now I can go to that very quickly. And eventually you, you leave the house and get from point A to point B, get out of the car and go, I don't even remember how I got here. You're like, I don't even, I literally don't even remember the roads I took. And I'm sure we've all had an experience like that driving where we just kind of like reawaken at that location. We're like, what? That's not it. Is that even safe? But a lot of times when we're learning skills, it's the same thing. It's like, I'm a big fan of protocols. I use a lot of, and even, I think we also need to uh, 
normalize weird solutions in relationships. And for one of my couples, they go what I call nuclear very quickly. So we actually had to build out a manual for their relationship. And it's what I started this manual for them. And now they continuously add to it, which is really cute when it happens. Cause they'll tell me they're like, Oh, um, a husband added a new thing to the manual today. I'm like, that's so beautiful. that they're just like, Oh, there's a new thing we can add, but literally proceduralizing this in the beginning, just like you have to proceduralize like, okay, when I turn left, okay, we hit the blinker, we look and you know, we do all these things. And many times learning a skill is just like that. Step one is, okay, I actually have to think fully through this as silly as it seems like, here's what we do in step one. Okay, we need to take three minutes apart. We're going to go breathe and then we're going to come back. Step two, step three, step four, step five. And eventually you can start to memorize that and you start to do, and then you get to be that. Now it's neurologically primed into your brain and we become the thing that in the beginning you started to feel like, oh my gosh, what a bunch of fakers. Well, yeah, of course you're a faker in the beginning. You haven't learned how to do it. Just like I heard a, a great, um, a guy explain this another way, uh, Vin Yang, I think is his name. Well, apologies to him if I'm uh, saying it wrong, but uh, I believe he's a, a dialect coach or a linguistic coach. And basically he talked about how if you see somebody on the uh, playing a trumpet, I think it was, you don't look at that person and go, you know, if they're very clearly not a professional, you go, you don't go, oh, what a faker. You go, oh, they're learning how to play the trumpet. But you need to have that same aspect when you look at the skills that you're building in your relationship. You're not a faker. <laughs> you're just learning how to use these skills. And many times you don't even know how to use the skill. You don't even know the trumpet exists in this case, which is, would be the skill for the relationship. So to put some of your minds at ease, if this is you, um, it's okay. We go from thinking, eventually you're going to get to doing, and then you get to being. But you have to get through the, each of those steps. And yes, it means you're going to have to be fully which it might even be weird and your ego is going to be like, oh God, what a loser in that thinking state. But we have to go through that in order to get to doing and then be it. And that's a good approach to look at it. Yeah, that's that's so well said, man. You know, especially if if you are someone who, again, my, my belief is usually people who are on a path of seeking to be more conscious often experience maybe more turbulence in, our, in earlier years. It's, it's so, so common. So if that's the case, there's maybe a good chance that you had no example of those skills growing up in relationships. And maybe all of your previous relationships, you had no experience of those skills. So now you're in this relationship where you want to make it work. And it's just recognizing, oh, maybe I've actually never witnessed or been a part of a skillful relationship where we actually have the skills to actually listen to each other to understand yeah. the other person's perspective. Like simple things, like what did I witness growing up? And then you realize that, and again you go, oh, it's not that my existence is a problem, it's that I was just never shown those skills. Yeah, one of the funniest exercises that I have for people is like, you know, I have this big, large explanation for it, but essentially it's just, you know, for guys when it comes to just listening, um, it's, it's, a, it's part of a, becoming a professional listener is what I call it is literally just sit there for 15 minutes and shut the fuck up. <laughs> you know, I've got all these large explanations for it, but it's literally just sit there, feel, listen, understand the underlying emotions. And really it's just a nice way of saying shut up and listen. <laughs> and we have to start to learn to sit in that silence sometimes while somebody else expresses. And that's a skill becoming a professional listener. And yes, there's so much more to that. You don't just sit there as a numb, just the, you know, zone out. There's so much more to that. I joke, but um, that is a skill in itself and it's okay. All of these things are little things that will build over time. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we wrap up? Oh, we could talk for hours. There's, there's nothing else on my mind right now. It's been a pleasure if anybody's been listening for the first time. My name's Dan and Max and Chuck. Pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I'm sure we'll link the Instagram below if you want to come check out some of the things that I share along the journey. Um, but other than that, nope, just a humble servant trying to make my way through the galaxy, as Django Fett would say in Star Wars. <laughs> uh, no, amazing, brother. Um, yeah, for anyone that is listening, check out 
Denon's uh, Instagram, the content on there is it's great, it's clear, it's precise, it cuts through a lot of the, the noise. It just gets to the things that I, I truly believe. Like you said, these, these understandings, these skill sets that can really be uh, applied in a, in a very practical way. So highly recommend everyone going uh, checking you out. Well, thank you for letting me speak to your audience. That's that's no small thing, and I really do appreciate that trust. So thank you, my friend. Hey, thank you, brother. It's my pleasure.